Hello, everyone. It looks like we're maybe live. Oh, there we go. We are officially live now, I think. Yes. So let's just get this quickly set up so we can see chat and um, our Zoom at the same time so I can see John and chat at the same time. Let's see. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear us? Okay. Um, welcome to the first episode of the Hidden Hour. And you will be the first people to witness the first <laughs> So tonight. It's Dr. John's show. I'm just honored to be his co-host. And we will probably evolve with this show too. One day we might have guests is that right babe and um, right guests topics yeah we'll 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 figure it out as we go it's it's going to be a learning process but right now i would say that the purpose of the hidden hour is to discuss all things crime related and mental health related so crime and mental health is the is the general theme of the hidden hour and of course as many of you know we've we've been discussing the daybell case in great detail but we will be picking up a lot of other cases as we go so um uh, you know and there's been so much crime and mental health issues in the news lately that i think it's it's really pertinent and hopefully it's it's timely and and that's our goal is to really delve into those two areas and how they relate to one another Yes, and we'll work also, we'll get, we'll get John a great microphone soon and we'll get some other stuff that makes everything nicer um, for this show. So you'll see us evolve. Anyway, we were gonna start uh, before the, uh, before the, the motion and the file came down that everybody saw, not everyone, a lot of people saw today we had a different topic in mind, but my mind was blown when I saw a request that the health and welfare be able to get involved and force medications um, for Lori Daybell. And I'm sorry if I didn't say that exactly right. I That might not have been the exact wording, but um, I about, was shocked. How about the, the court order? <laughs> the court order, thanks. Order, order, order medications. I don't know, force is, yeah, force, <laughs> force might be a little strong, but to, uh, to get her to comply with the court order. Right, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. And the thing for me was thinking, what? She really hasn't been on medication this whole time because we know um, we have a very good idea of her diagnosis. And so, well, first off, why don't you, is there something you wanna say about that? And <laughs> we'll go from there. What are your thoughts when you saw that? Were you shocked she wasn't on drugs? Medication by drugs? When I say drugs, I mean medication. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you, 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 you're probably referring to antipsychotics, yeah, but... Um, yeah, I mean, my, my first thought was we're getting a look, we're getting a, a more detailed glimpse of, of Lori's personality, right? Like this is someone who's manipulative and deceitful. And, um, you know, I, I talked about the whole notion of Machiavellianism in our last uh, YouTube live. And um, we're seeing some of that here, right? I think like, how can you have a court? I assume there's a court order for her to take medication. I mean, we have, I guess we haven't confirmed that. We haven't seen the court order, but um, she's, you know, somehow after several months, she's been able to avoid, apparently avoid taking medication, right? So that has to require a certain level of manipulation. And I don't, you know, I think we're we're witnessing all the things we've talked about with Lori. We're we're kind of witnessing it in action. Like, why isn't that happening? Um, what is she doing exactly to within that system or within that culture of the mental institution to avoid taking medications? Right? Is this 
is this another manipulation? Is there some kind of deception going on? I, I mean, this is, and please don't take this as a diagnosis, but this is, this is a, you know, potentially a, a psychopath in action, right? Who's, who's been able to avoid, you know, in a very restricted environment, has been able to avoid apparently the one thing she's there for. Mm-hmm. So wow, that that must that must take some that must take some special skills. Yeah, you know, Edie just wrote. It's good to see you, Edie. Um, that she thought that she couldn't refuse. I mean, clearly she could and has refused. Or she's so. or she's found you know some of the weak links in the system where she, you know, I don't know, you know, again, like it, it looked to me like they wanted to interview some of the people at the hospital, right? To kind of figure out what's going on. But, um, you know, is this a manipulation? Is she, is she working with certain, you know, is she able to manipulate or, or you know, to influence certain people that are supposed to give her her meds? I, I don't know. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, it's, 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 it's really astonishing in some ways that, you know, it's been months and nothing's changed, you know, that this, this is the same person that, that had a role, presumably had a role in, in some murders and um, has been manipulative her whole life and she hasn't changed one bit. Um, Filipino Food Club just asked, does anyone know if she was ever medicated or not? Or are we all still guessing? And, and uh, I, we're not there. We've only seen the, you know, what the docs say. But according to Kay Woodcock, we have exchanged texts because I asked the same thing to Kay. Um, I won't read her text, but let me be clear what I asked her. I said, uh, is it really true that she's not had any meds since being incompetent? And Kay started the text by saying in caps, exactly. So that's what we know right now from Kay. And, and she's angry because what has she been doing in there? Yoga? You know, what, what in the world has right. Lori Daybell been doing to be able to get to a better place so she can be competent to stand trial? Um, in addition to that, I want to talk about what we believe the diagnosis is. I cannot say uh, that we can confirm the diagnosis because we have not seen medical records, but a screenshot between a YouTuber and uh, what the Mark Means told the YouTuber is adult onset schizoaffective disorder is what the evaluator concluded um, when he allegedly concluded when he saw and evaluated Lori. And so knowing that, well, first off, why don't you tell us again, you've told us this before, Dr. John, but you didn't tell us this while we knew for certain that this was the rumor that Mark Means was telling a YouTuber, this is the diagnosis. So why don't you first explain to us what adult onset schizoaffective disorder is? And then I'll ask uh, my second question. Uh, So schizoaffective disorder, you know, at the most simplistic level, what I would say is it's, it's schizophrenia with a mood disorder. So in other words, it would be symptoms of schizophrenia. And so that would include one of three act, what we call active symptoms of schizophrenia, which would be hallucinations, delusions, or um disorganized thinking or speech and so it would be one of those three things um with a mood disorder so a mood disorder would be depression or maybe bipolar disorder i think for lori it would probably be something like depression but um but it's it's essentially schizophrenia with with a mood disorder so it it makes it a little more complicated you know if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna use antipsychotics, and and let me talk about that briefly too. So the second generation of antipsychotics, uh, which would be like Respiradone and Abilify 
and um, Sarah Quill. Uh, you know, there's there's a number of, of second generation antipsychotics that would be used to treat schizophrenia these days. And um, usually if you go from a baseline of no meds to meds, usually there, there's about a 70% chance of significant improvement from the medication. So we know the medications work well for the most part, right? So, um, so the problem here is when you throw in a mood disorder, it gets more complicated. You know, I, I could see, so it's possible, um, you know, Kay indicated that, that she's taken nomads. So that's, that's obviously problematic, but um, it's possible that maybe she, Maybe they gave her some meds at some point and stopped because uh, they have to use some combination of antipsychotics and probably like a second generation of, of antidepressants to uh, like, I don't know what, you know, Lexapro, Paxil, there's a ton of, there's all kinds of newer antidepressants. And so, the, you know, there's, there's going to be drug interactions. There's going to be, right, there's, it's going to be a little trickier to combine those two and to kind of address the combination of depression with schizophrenia. So that might complicate things a little bit, but um, if she hasn't taken any medications, then, you know, that's, that's mind boggling. That's, that's hard to, to imagine that she's been sitting in her day spa, which is the mental hospital apparently in, in Idaho you know, do what, doing whatever she does, dancing or whatever she's doing. I don't know, but so. Yeah, so, dancing, so yoga, reading. Yeah, reading. Or yoga, right. So, um, so schizoaffective is, is, you know, essentially it's a two-pronged diagnosis. It's the, and the mood disorder has to be present, by the way, during the active stage of schizophrenia. So in other words, um, there would need to be active hallucinations or delusions or disorganized speech or thinking thought patterns um, during the same time that there's some type of major depression. So you'd have to have a combination of all those together. Um, I think the DSM says like two weeks, two weeks of active, an active mood disorder with active symptoms of schizophrenia uh, to give the diagnosis. Okay, a few donations I want to thank. We've had some really generous, already very generous donations. Liz Johnson, thank you. Dal Pace, thank you. And Hazelnut, who said that she loves this duo, thank you. So I just want to say thank you to that. My questions with, my next questions with schizoaffective disorder is, how would one treat that. I know you mentioned it depends on what else is going on. There's a variety. Ozzy Tad just mentioned for a friend that has schizoaffective that some, some antidepressants can't be used because mm -hmm. it can send more, you know, mania sometimes. Um, yeah. She has a friend with it, but, but what, what do you do to treat it? And I think this is why I assume she was on drugs or again, medication by drugs is what I mean. Yeah, I mean, by far the most effective treatment for schizophrenia is is are going to be antipsychotics, second generation antipsychotics. So that's what you do to treat it. You know, back in the day, they would try like uh, you know electroshock therapy and all. I mean, they tried everything, lobotomies, right? So obviously, they're not going to do that today. But um, uh, it's better understood. There's clearly some you know biological basis to it. Um, now we believe, or you know, mental health professionals believe that uh, it's based on brain circuitry. So there's been an evolving, uh, there's been an evolution in mental health where, you know, we used to kind of say maybe it's the amygdala or the hippocampus or the prefrontal cortex or whatever. But now, now there's a tendency to see the brain, parts of the brain working systemically together. So. Um, so the general assumption is that certain parts of the brain function as a system. And when certain elements of that system are disrupted, then you have problems. So like in schizophrenia, for example, there might be some disconnect between like the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala regulates like fear and emotion and the prefrontal cor cortex is responsible for decision-making and problem-solving and higher level 
functioning. So we know like with schizophrenics that that's an issue at times, right? That their decision-making is, is impaired to some degree at certain times at least. And so uh, the brain circuits responsible for schizophrenia uh, tend not to function as well or work together as well. And, and you can see this on functional MRIs. You know, if you look at brains that are healthy versus have schizophrenia, um, they look very different. And, and so there's a general uh, belief now that, that what's showing up is the fact that the, these different parts of the brain, like the limbic system and the, the higher cortical regions of the brain, which are like the prefrontal cortex, are, are not as healthy and they're not working together as well in harmony. And okay. so how, how antipsychotics affect that exactly is not super clear, you know, we're, we're always an evolving field, but, um, um, but they do, they, like I said, they have about a 70% uh, success rate or at least a rate of improvement of symptoms. A couple of people now have asked you to define what second generation medications means in this call. Oh, so um, yeah, so, uh, so like with schizophrenia, Thorazine was one of the initial treatments of choice. And Thorazine um, was just discovered accidentally that they, they, they found that they were giving Thorazine for um, other medical problems. And they found that it was inadvertently um, affecting patients with schizophrenia. So, um, and they didn't really understand why, but... Um, but that was the treatment of choice for a long time, but it, it, it was much less effective. So um, that led to uh, research and um, more inquiry about, you know, what was it about Thorazine that was working and why was it working and what parts of the brain was it working on? And um, so through a process of trial and error and research, um, you know, they've developed an entire new line or generation of antipsychotics that are called second generation. So they're much more specifically targeted to certain uh, parts of the brain and neurotransmitters in the brain and um, they're more effective. So it was actually like a lot of scientific discoveries, Thorazine was used for other purposes, but was found to have some impact upon schizophrenia. So that was like the first major medication and the first generation of medications used for um, schizophrenia. And um, it was, Thorazine was initially a um, anti-convulsive medication or it was used for seizures. So um, they presume that um, some of the pathways that that was supposed to impact, like the dopam dopamogenic pathways, dopamine pathways, um, had some, some role in schizophrenia. So then they were able to refine that. Okay. Uh, Chelsea Hoagland, thank you so much for your donation. Uh, Carrie Livingston said something that I wanna read. Um, and while I find that comment, I'll say what two of our moderators, Edie, and Colette, both from uh, our moderators as well in the True Crime Underground group. Um, True, so the Facebook group, True Crime Underground, Lori Daybell Cold Mom. But they said that they both remember on a body cam uh, footage of Charles, uh, her now deceased husband, that he said Lori refused to take medication. So there's that. And then Carrie Livingston's comment kind of goes with that. She said, okay, isn't this, this isn't just Lori's part. People who are supposed to be moving her competency along also have a responsibility here, like her psychiatrist, Dr. Kuntz. I think maybe she might be manipulating him. Any thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of my lead tonight was like, what, how, how is this happening? You know, what's, what's the culture in that hospital? I, I think it wasn't part of the court order that they're going to interview or talk to some of the hospital staff. I think that was like the second part, right? Because I mean, I think they're trying to figure out what's going on. You know, what? Yeah, it, certainly there could be some manipulation. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what you do when someone outright refuses, which by the way, when you think about that, you know, you, you, when you, all the things we talked about with Lori and her family and the Cox family, 
growing up, like the anti-government sentiments, right, and the paranoia, like all of that is consistent with someone who's going to absolutely refuse any type of medication. And probably this perception, this belief in um, natural healing or healing through, you know, a higher force or something. I, I, don't, I mean, she's not like a Christian scientist, but I could see some overlap there, you know, that they like when her sister Stacy uh, was anorexic, they, they kind of refused to believe that, right? And mm -hmm. they blamed everything on diabetes, but even then she wasn't really getting treatment for diabetes. So, right, that was part of the reason she was deceased when she was so young is because I think the family culture here is very much anti-medicine and probably anti-science to some degree. So, um, and you see that with Stacy, right? We, we see that with her sister. So it's not surprising that, that she's refusing all medication or would refuse all medication because you've got this combination of paranoia and probably kind of anti-medical slash medication as part of her family culture. So, uh, you know, but how that's, play, how and why that's playing out in a hospital setting, you know, is, has got to be really interesting. Right, right. Um, and I want to, yeah, I agree. And someone insinuated, someone said that I insinuated that mental health facilities are uh, wonderful places because I said, what is she doing yoga? That was not my intention. My intention is what in the world are they doing? She's should be behind bars, you know, her children are dead. And I really want to know what are they doing? You know, I'm not saying it's a wonderful place. It's probably a lot nicer than where she was though. Um, yeah, so. I mean, they're not the typical, the typical mental hospital. I, yeah, it's a, right. It's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, I don't think you were me. You, I think you were being a little sarcastic, but not yes. didn't mean to be condescending in any way, but no. But, um, you know, compared to compared to being in a prison, I think being in a mental institution probably has a little more freedom, and if you know, maybe fewer restrictions. It probably it probably depends on where, by the way. So, and some Calista, of them the place she is offers yoga. I also have a brother who is a psychiatrist who works at a hospital, with so I am familiar as well. Um, and, and when you say the Cox family is you know, could likely be anti-medicine, -med anti-doctors. You're not saying that the Cox family is making this choice, but just sort no. of maybe where Lori could get her just refusal. I'm saying, yeah, yeah. I'm saying that the family culture that she grew up in shaped her beliefs about it. Yeah. The, the family culture has a major influence upon, you know, upon what the, the decisions he's making now, you know, that she's, She's, um, I think she's assimilated a lot of those beliefs probably. And, you know, we're, we're seeing them play out at the moment. Right. So that um, I don't, I don't have any, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I doubt that the family, I don't, I don't know enough about what they would tell her, but um, I don't, you know, um, I'm not saying that they're having, that they're having a direct influence on her in, in the mental institution or the mental hospital. Right, right. And and an RN just commented, uh, Hazelnut, um, again, thank you for the donation earlier. And she said that she's an RN and yes, it's much nicer than the jail would be. And that's what the comparison was. And it was again, sarcastic. Um, yeah, so um, there are a lot of questions coming in. Would a late onset schizoaffective disorder, would it come out because of a psychotic break? Like, do you think, are those? Um, you know, it, it, we've talked about this, you know. Yes, after, we have. After the last episode where we talked about this issue, um, you actually, you actually got on the phone with your brother, who's a psychiatrist, and said, hey, you know, which is because we had talked about it. You said, hey, wh what do you think of someone who gets diagnosed with schizophrenia at age 48? And he said, that would be highly, highly unusual, right? And that's kind of what I said, too, that, you know, the, the typical onset for schizophrenia is like 18 to 30-ish 
probably more like 18 to 26 ish for males, maybe a little later for females, 28, 30. Every schizophrenic client and or criminal I've ever seen has had onset somewhere in that range typically. So I've never seen a late onset case of somebody getting schizophrenia in their late forties. It's really unusual. So I kind of said before that, you know, if you look at the base rates, the, the just the base rate being like the probability of getting schizophrenia at age 48, it's, it's got to be astronomically low, like well less than 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you look at that alone, like the odds are really stacked against late onset schizophrenia, um, you know, just based on that. So, I mean, that's where you kind of have to wonder whether there is some type of malingering or, you know, what, what's going on here? Is this, is this real? Um, I'm sure they sent in some really, really qualified people to assess her. So, you know, I, I'm not doubting the uh, evaluation at all, but, um, but it is still a peculiar situation. And, um, you know, but, but we, you and I were talking earlier about the Matthew Coleman case. He's 40, he turned 40 and, um, the family, although the, a family friend has now said that he feels like he had a psychotic break um, and that the only way he would kill his kids. So those of you who, who have followed that case and know that he killed his two children, both under the age of two, right? Or one of them was like two-ish. Yeah, the Matthew Coleman case is a recent case. I'll just give a brief background for those that don't know we've done a couple episodes on our patreon account we'd like to bring it here to the hidden hour and continue with it because there are a lot of similarities very sad similarities with the daybell case but a surf school instructor named matthew coleman uh one day as the family was getting ready to go camping so he had a wife and two very young children the oldest was two the other was i can't recall but month i think an infant a boy and a girl they were getting they were packing to get go camping the wife claims that there was no argument before or anything, but that he just got in the car and left with the two children and didn't know where they went. She called police that night because she was concerned they didn't even have car seats in his car. And when the police came, she kind of said, well, I don't think that he would harm them. I'm sure, you know, that they'll be back. And so the next day they were back and she was again, very concerned. They tracked him, they found him in Mexico. And at that point, he had murdered both of his young children. A very, very tragic story. And the probable cause statement, when he talked to police in a law enforcement in Mexico, he said that QAnon conspiracy theories, he thought his children were going to grow up to be monsters and that he needed to kill them because his wife had demon DNA. And he also used the term that he needed to save the world. And so he, he stabbed his children with... Um, a spear fishing gun. So there's there's the background. And yeah, tell us the latest, Dr. John, on that. Well, the, the family, or at least family friends who I think might be speaking for the family are now saying that they, they believe wholeheartedly it was a psychotic break. So, but of course, um, of course that's what they're gonna, you know, I, I think if, if they're gonna come up with some narrative that makes sense to them. That's that's what it's going to be. I mean, it could be a psychotic break for sure. But um, my my point is though that that Coleman Matthew Coleman was was forty, and um, you know, again, you, you I would have to look at probabilities and and wonder. You know, nobody nobody with Coleman saw any signs of psychosis before that. You know, and even his wife. 48 hours before didn't really notice anything unusual. Right. So I, I don't know, you know, it, it's pretty clear to me that by the time he put him in the car, he knew what he was going to do. Right. So, so it's an interesting explanation, but I don't know if it's totally believable, but uh, you know, on the other hand, I don't know if our listeners are familiar with Herbert William Mullen, but uh, there's a lot with Herbert, Herbert William Mullen was a, serial killer who had schizophrenia who went on this killing rampage um he's much older i think he's probably like in his 70s now but uh or you know somewhere around there um 
but he had similar, he, you know, he, his killing spree involved, uh, he saw a hitchhiker and he stabbed her, killed her, like disemboweled her, cut her apart and left her body parts on the side of the road. Like it was really brutal, but his part of his, part of his crime spree was that he believed that God was telling him to do these murders um, and that um, he was preventing earthquakes and all these calamities and right. Like, um, you know, maybe it's like that with, with Matthew Coleman. You know, I, I thought when I thought about Matthew Coleman, I actually thought of Mullen and, and kind of his schizophrenia, but, but Mullen had schizophrenia from the time he was like 17. You know, he was, he was diagnosed early. Right. And so Matthew Coleman at 40, just to have, it's, it's a, it, it's different in that sense. Right. Like it's, it's a little more unusual and just like Lori. It, it, so if you just look at the probabilities, um, you know, the odds are against it, but, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. So the way it's possible is if there's some really traumatic event or some major trigger or some stressor that's overwhelms their ability to cope. You know, it overwhelms any type of resiliency or ability to adapt to whatever it is. Um, you know, that could, that could definitely push someone into a psychotic break. So it's possible that, you know, Lori, we've talked about this, there's the, what I call the diathesis stress model or the vulnerability stress model, which is that, you know, there might be some genetic predisposition to schizophrenia or psychosis that gets activated or occurs when, when there's a major stressor. So you know, sitting in jail, waiting for trial or waiting for charges, uh, knowing that you might be put on death row is, is I would imagine, has got to be a pretty big stressor. So uh, I don't know what that stressor would be for Matthew Coleman. It doesn't seem like there were any, except for this delusion that, you know, that somehow, you know, his, his kids had this DNA and, you know, but I mean, and even if they did, there wouldn't be any imminent threat. Right, his kids were so young that they're not going to like go out and, and take over the world at age two unless they had special powers. But um, so right. I don't. There's I don't. You know, it's a little. His is a little different in the sense that I don't. I, I can't imagine what a stressor would be. Maybe there was something in the marriage. I don't know. But uh, maybe there were financial issues. I don't know. But but usually, if you're if there's gonna like. In either of those cases, if there's going to be some type of significant psychotic break that's going to happen overnight, there's going to be some major trauma or stressor. You know, I, I would typically think of something like PTSD, right, where there's a life or death event potentially that that uh, impinges upon one's mental health. Well, so that's a good segue to a question Colette had, Colette Cox, and, and someone else responded as well. Colette asked, do Lori's mental health crises match up to times when Chad seems to try to disconnect publicly? Above that, she actually asked, would, and I can't find it, she, she highlights them well with her little question marks, but it was, would, you know, a, a, a psychotic break happen if she was brainwashed? I wrote out, if she was brainwashed by Chad, um, would that be like a way to lose her mind and in addition does it match up to when he pulls away and then someone responded that they've been wondering the exact same thing would she sort of um can't find it guys i'm this chat goes so fast and i've even slowed it down but they said that they had a similar question wondering about her deep compensating like when that happens and tyler chesley thank you for your very generous donation john we have had so many generous donations tonight we're so excited obviously people are excited for the hidden hour and so thank you babe and uh and i'll ask your question in just a minute tyler thank you uh so just so i'm clear about the question so the question is uh could the could her her psychotic break be tied to the fact or the perception that Chad is distancing himself from her or, or at least, I mean, which, which obviously this whole idea of, 
of Chad being framed would be consistent with that. Um, uh, you know, I, it could be, it, you know, it's, it's hard to really, sure. I mean, they're in separate cells, separate parts of the jail. Um, they can't communicate. I'm sure that's taking a toll on her. Uh, I'm sure that she's worried about his story and whether he's going to turn on her and right. There's, there's probably a lot of stressors there for sure. Um, for somebody who is potentially really dependent upon Chad for a lot. Um, yeah, I, I think that that separation would create a lot of stress. I, you know, again, I don't know if I had to guess, I wouldn't think that would lead to a psychotic break, but you know, neither Lori nor Chad are the most resilient human beings. So uh, maybe it wouldn't take a lot, you know, to really create the conditions for her to, for lack of a better term, to snap. So um, that's certainly possible. Yeah, that's an interesting, I haven't really considered the stress of that, but, um, but yeah, yeah Ozzy Tad says that if she agrees, if she's borderline plus rejection from Chad would probably flip her out. Colette added the question she had um, that I couldn't find earlier in the exact way she asked it was, if Lori was brainwashed, would we expect to see some of Chad's control to begin its lose, to lose its power by now? So that was a different question she had that I really botched. So in other words, um, if she starts to get better and she was brainwashed, but now she's not, does he start to lose any power? Uh, you know, I think, um, I think the term brainwashed is, is, is a difficult one. You know, it's, it's a little vague. Um, psychologists generally, the research on being brainwashed tends to show that it's not really possible to brainwash. So, I mean, it, let me, let me, let me go back on this a little bit. <laughs> Brainwashing is, and hypnosis for that matter, as a type of brainwashing, are only really effective if the person wants them to be. So there, there's a certain level of suggestibility, right? Like you can't, the notion that you can just walk in a room and like hypnotize someone or brainwash them is kind of far-fetched and it's not consistent with research. So, um, so I think it, it's, you know, it's, it's with Lori, it's not, I think Lori, if Lori's brainwashed, it's because she wants to be, right? She wants mm -hmm. to be brainwashed by Chad, but, um, and she was obviously influenced deeply by Chad. Um, but uh, I don't know, I, I don't, first of all, I don't think that's worn off to any great degree at this point. Like as far as we can tell, she's still really, you know, at least as of a few months ago, she's still a huge fan of Chad's. So um, she doesn't seem to have really detached too much from, from Chad. Um, she seems to be still under the impression that the world's coming to an end at some point. So she's still retaining these apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic beliefs, um, all of which would kind of tie her to Chad. But I mean, does she feel a little bit marooned by the fact that she can't communicate with them? Yeah, I'm sure she does. I'm sure it must be really difficult and stressful for her. Listener Chesney says that she is a psych RN and they bet that Lori is one annoying patient to everyone except the psychiatrist <laughs> she's possibly manipulating. Yeah. And Kay Woodcock is now here. Um, and so let me read to you what Kay has said. Um, Okay, she says that she is flabbergasted. She and Larry, we are flabbergasted with the idea that she isn't receiving all forms of remedies to get her competent, meaning she is competent. We cannot believe she is manipulating again. She is a master. And does that refusal to take medications kind of definitely imply that she's a little bit there at least, right? 
Uh, I mean, well, the manipulation does. If, it, if it's a manipulation, then she's orchestrating the whole thing, right? Like that means she's totally competent because she's she has the the presence of mind and the ability, like, right? She's 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 working the room, so to speak. She has the decision making capacity to to do that. Then she certainly probably has the decision making capacity to sit in court and know what the charges are and know what you know what she's been accused of and what she did. So, right. Um, yeah, right, exactly. Like if she, I mean, like, I don't know. If, if I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt, I'd say, um, you know, I don't know. If she is incompetent, then, um, <laughs> then <laughs> right, I can tell people aren't liking that. Um, but hey, you know, you're here to give us both scenarios, A, B, if she is, if she isn't. That's why the doctor is here. So if someone and, you know, is incompetent, if she is. You know, if, if she is incompetent, you know, yeah, I'd expect her to be a little more passive, but maybe, maybe like we talked about earlier, maybe it's these deeply ingrained beliefs about, you know, anti-medicine or doctors or, you know, that, that they're so ingrained that she could be incompetent and still refuse at a very deep level, you know, right. This goes back to childhood stuff. So um, she might be, if she's incompetent, I'd expect her to be more passive, but maybe she's passive and still refusing because she has these really deeply, you know, anti medication sentiments that go, go back a long way. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I think of too, and we haven't talked about this and you don't need to talk about it too much until we watch more, but Aiden Fucci recently kind of showed some mental illness in court. He is a young 14 year old who brutally murdered, murdered a classmate, Tristan Bailey. And uh, from all accounts, he seemed pretty with it. He was flipping the birdie in a police car. And now that he's in court, he's looking around saying the demons are going to get me. My opinion is that 14 year old is a psychopath and he's malingering. Um, so, you know, psychopaths do malinger. They do try to do this sometimes. Well, um, the stakes, you know, for, for Aiden Fucci, who's 14, the stakes couldn't be higher. You know, he's He's looking at, you know, because of his age, they might give him, him life without the possibility of parole. I don't, I don't know if they go for the death penalty for a 14 year old. Maybe, I don't know if they can switch it when he becomes an adult, but, um, you know, I, I think reality is setting in for him and he's realizing, you know, I, I think initially, I don't think he quite understood the ramifications of what he was doing. Uh, and now reality is setting in. So, you know, what are his options? If he can malinger and act like he's insane and pretend to see things in the room that aren't there, you know, that I'm sure he's going to try to do that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, our initial senses are that he was malingering, but John might not well, want the, to say that right now. The baseline, the baseline is that he, his first few court appearances, he looked fine. Right. Right. So, but again, again, is it, is, is this a really unusual stressor? Maybe, I guess you could argue like Lori, you know, confronted the reality of her situation and maybe he did too, I don't know. But, um, you know, he he had talked about murdering someone, Aiden Fuji had talked about murdering someone for a while and he'd told friends about it. So, but, you know, I, you get the sense that it was almost like a, a a game to him or I don't, you know. Awful, and he know. showed no empathy after, he's yeah, never. No, right. Yes, Stephanie Budrow, Matthew Coleman. Stephanie is one of our mods, thank you for being here, Stephanie. Matthew Coleman admitted he killed his children because he believed they were going to turn into monsters. Oh, and the emphasis is admitted, he admitted to this. But Lori hasn't admitted to anything that the public knows. Doesn't right. admitting uh, with a very strange reason, wouldn't that indicate mental illness? Uh, I, um, not necessarily. I mean, I think, 
I'd have to say like 75% of the criminals I get in front of don't admit initially. I mean, many of them come around eventually, I think, but um, admitting would actually imply that he's able to deal with reality to some degree, right? Like he's admit. I mean, the reality may be wildly skewed thinking that his kids are like monsters or lizards or whatever, but, um, but still like, like he know, like it, it shows that he had some awareness of what he did, mm-hmm. right? It, it shows that he wasn't like in that moment, he was aware of his surroundings and he was aware of that it was his kids. I, I don't know. You know, it actually, if they want to go with like an insanity plea, that's not going to help him. Right. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it, it seems like, it seems like he was kind of oriented. Maybe he wasn't when he did it, but I, you know, I don't, still like the fact that he admitted would actually kind of imply that um, there was some conscious intent and um, that he had some grasp of reality. Okay. So, so that would actually kind of imply that his mental health, I don't, you know, wasn't maybe as bad as someone who's in denial. Okay. I'm going to ask Tyler uh, Chesley's question now. He gave us a generous donation. What does Dr. John think about, and so we're going to get into Chad for a little bit. What does Dr. John think about Chad potentially being schizotypal? He just reminds me so much of the description Dr. Sapalski talks about in his Harvard lecture. There's a Harvard lecture on religion and mental illness. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Uh, You know, sounds interesting. I'd like to take a look at it. Um, uh, I don't really, I mean, he has some of those features, but um, he tends to be, I mean, he, you know, he's not super socially isolated. You know, he he goes to conferences and speaks and um, I think uh, he, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, it, I, I've thought about that. I don't really see him as being schizotypal per se. I think, I think there's definitely some narcissism. Um, I mean, he's not the most sociable guy and he doesn't have the best social skills, but he's able to function socially at a fairly decent level. Mm -hmm. Um, He doesn't really have kind of the bizarre mentation that you'd expect from schizotypal, uh, at least that I can tell. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe testing would would reveal some of that. But um, but yeah, I I think there's some overlap there. I don't know if I would I would go with that diagnosis, but um, but it's I think it's a good observation. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Here's another question that hasn't been on chat, but I thought it was great by Patrice. She, she emailed us this dear Dr. John question. She said that I have a family member. So we're back to Lori, that, you know, because Lori has this diagnosis, whether it's real or not, there's a diagnosis out there that a lot of people are becoming familiar with that's, you know, this adult onset schizoaffective disorder, if she has it. Uh, Dear Dr. John, I have a family member by marriage who has drug-induced schizophrenia. The story I am told is that it initially manifested in him preaching in casinos and subsequently has migrated to seeing bad and good spirits in people and other wacky things not pertinent to the question. My question is, if a person has schizophrenia, are they predisposed to think they are godlike? And if so... What part of the Daybell Vallow case could possibly be explained by it? So would a person be able to function in society and appear normal to others? So let's just focus on the, there are three questions there. If a person has schizophrenia, let's start with this one. Are they predisposed to think that they are godlike? Um, so that gets into different types of delusions. Um, so one of the, you know, one of the, three prongs of schizophrenia are hallucinations, delusions, or disorganized speech or thinking, like grossly disorganized speech or thinking. So you have to have one of those three to give the diagnosis. So let's, let's, 
that would fit in, you know, the delusional category, right? So um, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of delusions. Um, and there's actually different, there's some delusions are, are fixed beliefs that are resistant to any type of reality or evidence. And some delusions are called bizarre delusions, meaning that they're, um, they're kind of like the, um, like thought insertion is a bizarre delusion. Thought insertion would be like, you know, the CIA implanted a thought in my head or like an alien being, you know, pl planted a thought in my head. So there's, there's really different kinds of delusions and the fixed ones are, are a little trickier to kind of figure out because some of those could be cultural and that's where it gets really confusing. Like with Laurie and Chad, you know, they grew up in families and environments where some of their beliefs are explicable by that, right? So they're, are, they are resistant to reality to a large degree. Um, you know, Chad, for example, kind of living in this fantasy world that doesn't exist and probably will never exist um, is, yeah, there, there's definitely something delusional about that in the sense that he's, he's not living in the real world per se. Um, but in the conferences he attends, it's, it's, it's perfectly understandable, right? So it's, it's kind of hard to ferret out, but the, um, the, the question you're asking is there, there are religious delusions about um, like with Matthew Coleman, saving the world, right? There's religion, there's delusions of grandiosity, which is that someone thinks they're special or, or talented or in a, in a really, uh, in a, really major way that doesn't fit reality. Um, there's delusions of, of persecution, you know, that the CIA and the FBI are, are always, you know, tapping our lines and trying to get us. There's uh, delusion, somatic delusions about constant bodily issues. And like there's, so there's a lot of different kinds of delusions. Um, I, I think for Chad, uh, and maybe to a lesser extent for Lori, you know, like there's definitely potentially some religious delusions. Like one of the things I didn't talk about on our last live that, that is part of um, the pathology of mass murderers and tyrants and dictators is a messiah complex. In fact, um, you know, I, <laughs> I, I've been studying Hitler a little bit late recently because I've really avoided it. You know, it's, it's, it, for forensic psychologists, it's kind of like the Mount Everest of, of, of pathology. You know, you, you don't really want to climb Everest unless you have to. Um, but if, you know, if, if, if you're willing to, you know, it's, it's the, the view is great and it's a great challenge and you're probably going to learn a lot. But so uh, probably, you know, I mentioned Hitler a little bit and, and I was kind of making some per comparisons to Daybell. I mean, it's, it's a really loose comparison, by the way, you know, I don't, I don't, see, I don't see Daybell at that level, but, um, but the, one of the most distinguishing features about Hitler was he had a Messiah complex that Hitler thought he was chosen to restore Germany to greatness. And um, he believed he was the only one that could do that. Uh, so it, it was a delusion that was bordered, that bordered, it wasn't just grandiosity, it bordered on religious, the religious, right? It was this delusion of being a messiah. And, and Chad certainly has some of that, right? And, and maybe to a lesser degree, Lori, because Chad convinced her of it. But, um, but when you think that you have, you know, the vision of the future and you write books that suggest that you're the one out of seven trillion people that's going to deliver that vision of of the post-apocalyptic world that's that's kind of getting into that messiah complex arena right right lindy bountiful thank you for your donation and she asks that maybe i ask you the percentage of schizo those who have schizophrenia. And yes, we know that she has schizoaffective disorder. Other people said that. We explained that what that was exactly at the beginning of this live. Um, but now, you know, we're just, we're using some different terminology. But if, if um, can you give a percentage of how many who have schizophrenia 
commit murder from what they understand the numbers are low, which I think was a good thing to point out. We're not saying that those who have schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia go out and commit murder. We're only talking right. about it because it's this possible diagnosis. Yeah, that, so this is, right, this is a whole, this gets into kind of the forensic arena. Um, and right, that, that's, the, that's the question is, is, is there a relationship between schizophrenia and crime? And so um, they've done surveys showing that um, most, the vast majority of schizophrenics or people diagnosed with schizophrenia um, will never be violent. So it's 80% it's or above. Um, however, um, there is, there is some indication that schizophrenia plays a higher role in homicide than someone in the general population. So, um, and again, that's not to say most people with schizophrenia are not violent whatsoever and they have, they're never going to kill someone. And, um, but compared to someone without the diagnosis in the general population, uh, for men, the, the, the number is something like eight to 22% of men diagnosed with schizophrenia will um, commit some type of violence and or even homicide. So in the general population, that number is way less. So, you know, like more like 2%. So, you know, there is, there is a correlation between schizophrenia and um, potentially homicide that's that's not great but it's it's way higher than the normal po population um, and I think the reason for that is because it has to do with the notion of self or selfhood that I think when somebody gets to the point like Matthew Coleman let's use him as an example like I think what happens with somebody like Matthew Coleman is they start losing their sense of self. They're like those boundaries between the external world and the internal world start breaking down. And ourselves, our identities are kind of what keeps us oriented to the world, right? They're, they're like how we make sense of the world and how we navigate in the world. And when those boundaries start disintegrating, I think, you know, there's, there's potential trouble ahead, especially if you have these beliefs um, that suggests that you need to take action to save the world, right? Or you have to do something drastic to make things right. You know, I, th I think that combination of kind of the self disintegrating, which is more prevalent with schizophrenia, um, you know, than, than it would be for the typical person and kind of these extreme beliefs, you know, that's, that's probably a volatile combination. Thank you. Because Kay Woodcock was late, and I'm sure a few other people were too, because our numbers have gone up, I want to reiterate that at the beginning of this episode, John and I were both shocked that Lori was not on medications. And uh, to me, I don't know how anyone would expect her to regain competency without medication as part of that treatment, and we were dumbfounded. So while we're kind of speculating on some things now, um, I would recommend to anyone now listening, head back to the beginning to kind of hear our base thoughts about hearing this news today. Dr. John, I know that you and I wanted uh, called it the hit an hour because we were gonna just go about an hour and we've hit an hour. Although I, we did start, I think a few minutes late. So let me um, bring up something else from last week. Is that okay? Is there something else you wanna mention about this really quickly? Uh, I don't think so unless, unless people have some I mean, I, I hope I've answered quite a few questions around it, but um, if people feel like there's some questions I didn't get to, um, I'd be happy to answer those. But what was your, what was your, <laughs> what was your question? Um, my question is, and th Chelsea Jagman, thank you so much. She said she just paid for Patreon. Thank you, thank you. So she said she's just paid for that and she's saying she's giving a lower donation tonight. It's not as very generous, so thank you. Um, uh, and she asks if Lori Vallow could have been schizoaffective long before the diagnosis. Um, if she has it, yeah, that's possible. If, if she does indeed have that. Is that right, John, that that's, 
uh, adult onset's very rare. And so it's- Well, I, I think the answer is there could be some predisposition. Predisposition. You know, there, there she could have, it seems like there, there might be some history of schizophrenia in the Cox family. Um, so there could have been some pre predisposition that didn't, you know, didn't manifest itself until all the stress started hitting her or these stressors started piling up. Right. Thank you. Yes. And we do know, you know, and Charles on the in body cam footage was saying something was wrong with his wife. And yeah. um, you know, people have said there was there were some changes. Um so last week we released an interview. No, not an interview. I always say interview because I do a lot of interviews. It felt like an interview because I edited it for so long and had to listen to it. But we did a, we released a recording, a secret recording of Chad Daybell speaking for 45 minutes all about his beliefs, which side note, I have to tell you something funny about that release. We've had a lot of people listen, but YouTube shows us how long people stay on a video. Uh, so you can compare to other videos and our views were high. The amount of people staying were low. Chad Daybell is the reason, is probably a person most people are fascinated with, Lori and Chad, this, this horrendous crime is because of them. Yet my interviews with everybody else from Eric Smith, his friend, people are staying longer on that interview than listening to Chad Daybell. In other words, everyone that says Chad Daybell is boring proof that nobody can handle listening to Chad Daybell. Every <laughs> people could handle about 10 minutes tops of his 45 minute speech. I got a kick out of that thinking that people would listen, I would rather listen to any other interview we have and not listen to a recording by Chad Daybell. But beyond that, <laughs> Yeah, it's like, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. How long are you going <laughs> to sit there with that? I know, and it kind of shows probably how much that attention really did mean to him, because if he was that boring and that dry, to have the sort of attention he was getting probably re really was special to him. Uh, but one thing that we were going to address in tonight's podcast, and we didn't get to it because we changed directions with uh, the new news tonight was Chad Daybell's near-death experience. He writes about it in his book too, but he shares about it. And a lot of people have talked about it. The fact that he jumped from a cliff at Flaming Gorge that he claims is 60 feet. Armad Julie Olden did some research. The highest cliff jump in Flaming Gorge is only 50 feet. And you know it wasn't the highest that he jumped from. So we're, you know he's probably jumping from 15 feet I'll give him that. And he hit the I th water. I think comes. it was more like, I think it was more like five or 10, but you know, uh, but, but okay. Yeah. Let's go with 15. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you, Colette, for your donation. So he jumps off this 15 foot cliff. He sees a light, which Julia Holden also pointed out was probably the surface that he was looking at because he was deep. And his body went deeper than his spirit, probably felt like that because you hit hard. Comes back up and then he claims there was a near-death experience. There was no going unconscious. There was no going to the hospital. There was no, you know, there was no almost drowning experience. And people are, as Colette said it, I thought it was funny. She's like, I've never heard of someone saying, you know, something's making a belly flop so dramatic. And I've been listening to our episodes again. I believe that it was it was either episode 11 or 12 where we talk about his near-death experience and we talk about someone, one of our sources close to the Daybell case. And they agreed, or sorry, close to the Daybell family. We have a source close to the Daybell family and we shared that they did not believe his near-death experience. They believe he just had an awful fright um, with his belly flop into the water. And so it got you and I talking earlier today or last night when we were finally um, alone without our toddler about Chad's resiliency that he shared so many boring stories in this speech proof because of how many people couldn't even handle listening they were boring and made them so dramatic and traumatic even his near-death experiences 
were really, really, you know, is that a big deal? So it does seem like Chad does not have a lot of resiliency. And I wanted to ask you about that, which means we're now officially over our hidden hour time, but I still wanted to get into that a bit since it's a recent release. Um, so, uh, I, you know, my initial thought is, let, let me answer it a little bit, but maybe we can pick it up okay. in our next episode. So, um, uh, you know, we have to leave a little bit of, of uncertainty or a little bit of tension maybe, um, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do to get people to listen again? Um, Right, right. At least the, the, the Amazon documentary you're watching sure did that. So we had to like keep watching the next episode. Right. So we'll do the same. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it's a great question because, you know, um, people are always asking us like what, so, and we talk up, hopefully we talk about this on our podcast. You know, the, the question is, is there an antidote to kind of Chad and Lori's really bad mental health, you know, in other words, like what makes for good mental health and what makes for a healthy human being. And so one of the things I really like about crime is the fact that it, you know, I get to see the absolute worst in people, but I also get to think about how could this person have been healthier? How could they have been a better human being and what would have contributed to that? And I think more so than most psychologists, who deal with, you know, people with a lot of serious problems, um, I have to reflect a lot on that issue because crime is like so far, it's such an outlier on the extreme end um, that I get to see the worst pathology, but I also get to think about what the healthiest part of people look, looks like. And so, um, so a, you know, a short answer is, is resiliency, that people who are healthier tend to be resilient. And um, some of the elements of resiliency um, are cognitive flexibility and cognitive complexity. So cognitive flexibility is just the idea that when, we, when we're confronted with new information, that we're open to it and that we have the flexibility to adapt to it. And um, obviously with Chad, you know, if we're, if we're using Chad as an example, there's zero cognitive flexibility because he's living in this fantasy of the future. Like not only has the future not happened, but he is so intent upon selling that version of the future that he won't entertain any other ideas, right? So he's like the complete opposite of someone who's resilient in the sense that when new information, you know, occur, when new information um, happens that he's, He's not able to integrate it or adapt to it, and he has no co cognitive flexibility. He's just going to go out and sell his books that have one version of the future, um, and he's going to stick to that version. And that's someone who you know is going to struggle probably to do business with the real world to some degree. Right. Thank you for and, sharing that. And then the the issue of cognitive complexity would be. Um, that the more we learn from the world, so the more we're able to take in new information and the more we're able to learn from that, uh, the more complex our representations of the world get, right? So like uh, an expert in any area would be distinguished from someone who's not an expert because their, their representations of the world are much more complex in certain areas. So, um, you know, a classic example, and there's been a lot of research on this, would be like a fighter pilot. So they've looked at the way uh, expert fighter pilots um, think about flying an airplane, you know, versus novice ones. And they're very different. The experts have way more um, complexity in their representations of how the plane works and how they engage with the enemy and all this other stuff. But the, And they have way more links between all of these uh, cognitive psychologists call them nodes, but they're conceptual representations of the world, and they they're just they're they're just vastly different from some from people from fighter pilots that are just starting out. And so the same thing applies to to all areas of life. You know, being a parent, right? Like uh, we learn as we go, and our 
our cognitive representations become more complex and nuanced the more we learn about our child and his needs and how other parents do it. And so, but it applies to work. It applies to kind of how we see the world. And so the thing I would say about like Chad Daybell is um, very limited cognitive complexity, right? That his, his representation of the world in probably many areas seems to be really, really simple. And so if you see things really simplistically, you're probably not developing an accurate representation of the way things are. Thank you. Thank you. I knew you'd have a great answer to that. Marcella, thank you so much for your donation as well. It was a great question. We're going to try to answer those questions on Friday, but I have written down your question, Marcella, and so we'll try to answer that Friday. Um, anything else you'd like to answer, babe? Some people are saying you need a good background. You've got a white background that's turned blue. Yeah. So you also probably need a good light in there and some curtains on your window as the lighting changes. Someone suggested ink blots. I actually have the Rorschach test in frames, but I doubt you'd let me do that because John feels like we should protect it a little bit, but we'll see. Um, that is available. So people give your suggestions for a background for John and we'll get you some lighting, babe, and a microphone. And this show, we're excited. They said, you don't even need to manipulate or leave us hanging is what they mean. Cause you'll never manipulate us, but you don't need to leave us <laughs> hanging with something that we want to see. They said, they will be here next Wednesday for the hidden hour. And we're so excited that you guys are with us on this first episode. Like we said, this is gonna evolve and we're going to uh, keep making it better, so. Yeah, so we, we want to engage with our audience always. I think that's our first priority, but we wanna probably bring on some guests and um, we'll talk about different topics and we'll talk about different crimes and um, yeah, we're really excited. I was joking earlier with Lauren that um, we should aspire to, how many episodes did Larry King have? Like thousands or something? Like, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be no like, idea. wouldn't that be like the pinnacle is to have like 5,000 episodes or something? But um, I don't think we're going to get there, but, um, you know, we, <laughs> we want to make this, you know, as, as excellent as we can. And um, we have fun doing this and we're really grateful that, that anybody listens, to be honest. Yeah. Someone said you need something on the back of your wall to hide. That's a little inside joke. John doesn't know I told the truth, but I told them what's behind this giant flower. And so they know that I placed the flower there to kind of cover that up. So, <laughs> um, yes. And someone else said a bookshelf, which is actually what's supposed to be there. John is an avid reader. Don't even ask him to do Kindle. Our entire garage is full of boxes of books. We park in the driveway. Why? because the entire two car garage is full of books. And he has books in our bedroom and he has books in his office. And so we are working on um, getting some bookshelves so that we can also have a garage. And so maybe that's the answer. We'll just get you to find some bookshelves. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for our mods that are here as well. Um, all of them showed, you know, showed up, Julie, Stephanie, Edie, Colette, I'm sorry if I missed everyone uh, or somebody that's here modding. Thank you. And until next Wednesday, and then I will be here for TGIF, uh, 7 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. That is in the works. I'm going to work on, I've been talking to Lori Hellis. We're absolutely, Lori and I are going to definitely keep doing our thing, but we're also going to add some other uh, other guests, some other crimes while we focus on the Daybell case the most. So I'll let you know later this week who that's going to be the plan on TGIF too. So thank you. Have a great night.